Serbia was overrun by three armies several months ago, and what remained of the Serbian army escaped into the frozen Albanian mountains. And this week, after a nightmare of a winter, the Allied evacuation of the Serbian forces to Corfu is complete. I'm Indy Nidel. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, Austria, Hungary, and Bulgaria continued their invasion of Albania. A Russian offensive was advancing on Erzurum, and in the west, there was action in the skies, while at home in Russia, there was a shakeup in the government once again. Here's what happened next. Last week, we looked to the skies, and this week, I'll look to the seas, where there were scattered events. On the 8th, the French armored cruiser Amaral Charnier was torpedoed off the Syrian coast, 374 drowned. Also that day, Turkish positions on the Anatolian coast were bombarded by the Russian fleet. On the 10th, four minesweepers were attacked by Germans off Dogger Bank, one sunk. And on the 11th, the HMS Arethusa was mined off the east coast of Britain. And the German merchant raider Merve is reported to have sunk five ships since January 16th. And speaking of Russians attacking the Turks, that was happening on land this week as well as the Russian army advanced on Erzurum. Last week, we looked at the Turkish battle plan, and by now, their 11th Army Corps had performed its function and drawn the Russians into a hopeful trap. But the 9th, 10th, and 3rd Corps were all beaten back, with the 3rd almost surrounded. Russia had about 300,000 men there, and the Ottoman Imperial, Kurdish, and Arab forces totaled about 200,000. By the end of this week, the Russians on the Kars Erzurum Road were making frontal assaults on the outer forts of Erzurum. Let's look at Erzurum for a minute. It was on a plateau 2,000 meters above sea level, and the forts were on high ground that commanded views of the surrounding country. So no matter how well the Russian transport managed to do its job, there was no way Russia could have gotten the number of heavy guns up there that had been used so successfully to destroy fortresses like the Germans did against the Belgians, for example. So you weren't going to have a situation where infantry just marched in to occupy positions destroyed by shell fire. So the Russian infantry was advancing against pretty much wholly intact defenses. And yet, in just five days, General Nikolai Udenich's army took nine of the outlying forts and had forced evacuation of the whole fortress. Why was this? Infantry couldn't possibly take Erzurum by direct assault. This had been proven in the Russo-Turkish War when the Russians failed to take Erzurum in 1877, even with a huge manpower advantage. And Erzurum at that time was far weaker than it is now in 1916. It seems that Erzurum was evacuated because of the fear of isolation and the danger to the Turkish lines of communication. Just think, no matter how well-provisioned Erzurum was, and let's be clear, it was, it still could not withstand an indefinite siege. The Ottoman High Command had to be thinking of the fortress of Przemysl that had fallen to the Russians with over 120,000 Austro-Hungarian frontline troops after a long siege last year. How do you think the Ottoman High Command felt about bottling up 200,000 of its frontline troops indefinitely at Erzurum? It seems that a retreat was the best available option, but even that was going to be tricky. In the best of times, it's not easy to transport a retreating army with supplies, guns, ammo, and everything else, even if you have a good railway organization. But this was something of a nightmare. It was like 300 kilometers to the nearest railhead, snowstorms were raging, and the temperature was minus 25 degrees Celsius, and there were only a few roads total to transport everything. Oh yes, and there was an advancing Russian army 300,000 strong. But by the end of the week, the evacuation had begun, and the Russian infantry marched on. Meanwhile, another assault and simultaneous evacuation was proceeding further west in Albania. Austro-Hungarian and Bulgarian troops were advancing, and by the end of the week were within a few miles of Durazzo, the capital. The surviving Serbian soldiers that had retreated from Serbia to Albania during the invasion of Serbia were now being evacuated from Albanian ports to the Greek island of Corfu. On February 10th, the last of the Serbian troops were evacuated. There were some 75,000 of them on Corfu, and 8 to 10,000 of them a day had been transported, in spite of Austrian ships and submarines trying to prevent this. The Serbian minister in Paris, Dr. Veznic, had this to say. 
One hope still illumines the night of invaded Serbia, her avenging army. At present, that army numbers more than 100,000 men. It can confidently be stated it will be increased to 150,000. Not all of the Serbs had been sent to Corfu. Many had been sent to Biserta or Italy. And to Italy, we now journey as well. The Italian front had been pretty quiet since early December, when the fourth battle of the Isonzo River had ended. But the Christmas season had not been so good for the Italians. Morale was low, and we've talked about the terrible state of much of the equipment and the soldiers' living conditions. But there were changes afoot. Italian Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna's plan was to wait until April and then do the same as before. Send waves of men over the top against the Austrians. One minister, only one, Minister of War General Vittorio Zuppelli stood up to Cadorna and suggested an alternate plan. He showed that most of the nation's heavy and medium artillery was not deployed usefully on the Asanzo, and he proposed an offensive that would take place now on the Corso River, with at least 500 big guns launching it with a bombardment on a front no wider than 12 kilometers, which would produce an intensity like that found on the Western Front. Zuppelli presented his plan to Parliament, but Cadorna thought this was a stab in the back, and he appealed to the King, the only person to whom he was accountable, and who was sympathetic to Cadorna in general. Cadorna also used his contacts in the press, where he soon received the title Generalissimo, which stuck, to play himself up as a great leader. When Cadorna then told the Prime Minister that either Zuppelli went or he did, the writing was on the wall, and Zuppelli soon resigned. But he had done his job well. Machine guns and mortars were being produced in huge numbers, and perhaps most important of all, the Bombarda, a mortar kind of like a grenade thrower with a high trajectory, was now in large-scale production. This was a big deal because the Italians finally had something that could take care of Austrian barbed wire, rip it apart, and even blow it out of the ground. Also, and also finally, the infantry was issued with heavy boots and overcoats, and by the time spring would arrive, much of the army was actually better equipped for the first time than the enemy. Barracks were disinfected, cholera vaccinations were given, and sentries and wire-cutting parties finally got iron helmets. And even if the actual battle tactics weren't going to change at all, battle conditions got better for the Italians. They were no longer required to wear their heavy backpacks when they charged across no man's land, and officers were now allowed to direct attacks from behind, which was a big deal considering the incredible casualty rate among officers leading charges in 1915. Cadorna was still firmly in control, but his army was looking a lot better than it had just a short while ago. And yet another week of the war comes to an end. Action at sea. The Germans still building up for an offensive at Verdun. The Serbian army regrouping on Corfu as Albania is overrun. And Russia advancing on a great prize, Erzurum. You kind of have to think Russia needs something like this. A prize. A major victory of some sort. A successful offensive. Anything to take people's attention away from the troubles at home. Because, as Peter Hart wrote in The Great War, the underlying problems faced by the Russian Empire had not gone away. The fact that the weak and indecisive Tsar Nicholas II was nominally commander-in-chief could have stood as a metaphor for the undeveloped and primitive state of the country, in thrall to an inefficient and despotic system of government. Yet at the same time, the Tsar's symbolic accession to that position also underlined the continuing determination of the Russians to fight on regardless of losses and the losses had indeed been grievous in 1915. The Russians had plenty more men. Indeed, they still mobilized a far smaller percentage of their teeming population than many other nations, as the French did not fail to remind them. But how much longer would the morale of the ordinary Russian soldier hold steady? But really, if you follow this show week by week, you have to ask, how much longer would the morale of any soldier hold steady? I briefly talked about the soldiers' equipment this week, and if you're interested in that topic, you can check out our small series about the uniforms of the Warring Nations. Click here to learn all about German uniforms, for example. And if you'd like to wear the official Great War uniform, check out our merch store. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Jonut Movanu. Thanks to Jonut's support, we were able to improve our animations, which will be very important for the battles ahead. So why not support us on Patreon as well? You can find out more on our Patreon page. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.